Good day, everyone. Uh, Justin here uh, for the DJ Hour. Uh, so yeah, we've got a, a nice uh, VIP guest today. Uh, we've got uh, Shitaki coming in to join. I don't know if he wants to mention his, his real name, um, but Shitaki is head of people at Pangolin and uh, kind of helps like he's kind of the head of culture so what that means is he you know he really helps out with you know kind of cultivating the culture we want to incorporate at pangolin really helping our people making sure that they have you know uh, access to all the resources they need to contribute um he's been a fantastic addition to pangolin and yeah um real i think we're really privileged to have him um before before we kick off though I, Stephen probably will be joining too i know he's in another meeting i just wanted to go through the kind of boring stuff as per usual is uh just the financials this is not financial advice uh all of the content within the stream is purely for educational purposes um if you want financial advice you know you probably need to find a financial advisor uh but this certainly isn't financial advice um yeah um shitaki you want to uh introduce yourself what, what do you like i don't know how you want to play it yeah no that's that's fine look what, what i'll do is I'll, I'll come off i'll put, put the, the camera on uh nobody really wants to know my real name because shitaki is a much cooler name than my real name so 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 uh yeah no it's been amazing working with you guys at pangolin um as we say in ireland part of my job is to create the crack and uh, for those of you that don't know what the crack is it's basically creating the good vibes in the team, as well as some of the boring stuff, uh, you know, some of the legal legal side stuff and ensuring everybody has what they need and, and all that stuff. But uh, I have to say, just one of the best roles I've ever had in my life because of the people that you get to work with and the speed of the of the development in the space, the innovation, the also the free the creative freedom that people have. It's just it's really inspiring. So um yeah like the great thing about working with people that are so tuned in to DeFi as well is that you get alpha on a constant <laughs> so justin over here you know shared something to the uh the other day i think it was yesterday about uh, a power chain that's coming up uh, i don't know if you want to talk about that justin but it looks really interesting Mm, yeah um yeah i mean that you nailed it like so if infinity is actually its engine so it's the team behind like the engine token and they're actually pretty unique in that they pioneered the erc 1155 token standard and what that standard actually allows you to do is it allows you to create a basket of tokens so like the use case i normally talk with people is like you know like um, let's say, for example, I want to uh, transfer money to my missus or even, you know, let's say to Shitaki, let's say we're going to Barcelona and I want to uh, like transfer maybe like a hundred bucks in USDC, but maybe I also want to give him like an NFT. Um, so now today I've got to go to MetaMask. I've got to send each one of those manually and then pay gas for each one of those transactions. Um, whereas an ERC1155 allows me to like put all of these tokens into like a basket and then i just say oh yeah grant i'm going to choose the ones i want to use uh, or to send and then i send it so it saves me gas and it saves me um, a lot of kind of administrative overhead so they pioneered that they wrote the actual uh, ethereum improvement uh, specification or proposal and now this is the next evolution of that so i think what you find is you got erc20 which was like the you know de facto standard uh still is the de facto standard but you're now starting to see what will be the next major breakthrough in token standards and my thoughts are that the engine team are the ones that are leading this innovation in the space so first of all with the 1155 and now with the next version they're doing like what they call a para token which allows the best things about 1155 but also allows like other things like a fuel tank. So I'll give you an example. Like we have a multi-sig at Pangolin, right? So like, and <laughs> no one ever wants to execute like the transactions because it, it charges gas. So like, like everyone will confirm and then like generally I'll have to execute, right? Like especially for big transactions because it's super expensive. Um, so now this standard also allows you like a fuel tank where, you know, you can actually just kind of top up with fuel and it can be used for specific 
purposes in your organ on your dial right so we could have like a fuel tank for pangolin and we could tuck in like a hundred bucks every week or two and then anyone on the multi-sig for multi-sig transactions could just use the fuel or the gas from the tank and that way like people wouldn't have to spend their own money because at the moment what we're doing is we're saying oh yeah multi-sig signers they have to actually execute and then we refund them so it creates this whole extra thing when instead we could just create a fuel tank and then people could use it as long as it's for the specified reason that we're happy with, which I think is genius. Yeah, I remember first my first time coming across that that standard, the eleven five five five. It was actually because you posted it on Twitter, uh, and I had no clue about the, that that standard before. Uh, but I, if I understand it correctly, it's it's where you could just combine multiple tokens and and NFTs into one token, right? Exactly, exactly right. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you look over here, like, and you go look at the ERP one one five five, yeah, you can. So, so Ethereum actually, like, what they do is they, they have these things called Ethereum improvement proposals. So anyone can propose one, and you know, from yeah, you know, they can they go through like different statuses, right? Like, so draft accepted. Uh, this one's obviously final and you can see these are the fellas from um engine and then like it goes through exactly how it gets implemented and pretty much what it can achieve so like there you can see you got a transfer batch which then allows you obviously batch transfers uh very very cool actually um so yeah um do when did they come up with that when did they create that okay cool so you can you, you can see like you know these are the building blocks of i guess the future so i mean this is the crazy thing for me though that it like takes like what is that like three years you know four years almost you know from when someone proposes a token standard to i guess adoption use cases and then like most people don't still don't use this token standard. It, like it hasn't garnered mainstream adoption, um, which is interesting because the thing is it, it, it's, <laughs> it makes so much sense. Like we have these issues like, so uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting. So yeah, no, it's uh, really cool. Oh, there's Steven. Sorry. Did I check him on? Oh so no, that's my screen. No so why why don't we go through like an example, a few examples of like what we could potentially do with this? Like how if I'm if I'm at say I'm a DGen, I want to ape into something. I want to know what's how is this going to benefit me as an ape? Well, so this is the problem, right? So the thing is, this is just a standard. So it's not an implementation. So what what a lot of these things do is they say, okay, this is actually a standard. Um, and then it's up to the community to implement it. Like just like GraphQL is actually a specification that came out of Facebook, and then it's up to people to then implement it into like coding languages. So one of the things I thought about with EI with 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 one one five five is you create a front end, and then you can actually then deposit your tokens in because you got to send it right. So first of all, you got to create an ERC one one five five. And then you've got to actually deposit tokens into it like a basket so there's i mean you know you could obviously go through engine use how they do it um they, they've got i guess the the most mature implementation of it as it were um but this is really from a technical perspective it's more like a build like a toolkit right so if you build in applications you, you've got an option of like, how do you build your application? And this is just one, uh, I guess it's it's one tool in your toolbox that can allow you to build better applications as it were. Um, so like, for example, like the, the, the thing I'm always thinking about is bridge, right? If, if you want to bridge, let's say, you know, I know Cryptbarter had their swim network. I think it's alpha main net at the moment. Now let's say, for example, I wanted to take like, all my nfts from the c chain and all of my, like all of my cra all of my taz and maybe a bit of usdc or you, you know ust and take that all over to the subnet so like today i'm gonna have to go to a bridge probably i'm gonna have to manually transfer every single thing i have over like one by one i'm gonna pay gas on all of those transactions 
like that particular use case for the user is a bit not cool. And again, like I, I may have misunderstood like providers roadmap. So, so forgive me if I've like, if, if, if they've got an alternative, um, but that's how I understand it, it. It probably will work. Whereas if they had an, a, a bridge that did one, one, five, five, you could go into a front end, you know, you could have a multi select and choose and then boom, push it and then have all of those tokens on the other side unwrap. Um, so that's like a kind of use case. If I was building a subnet, that's something I'd be considering with bridges to just to make it easier for my users or to, for the users. Right. Um, and yeah. And one, one, five, five is key to that. Also the nice thing is with, uh, Infinity is they're going to back port some of this new functionality back into EVM compatible chain. So what that means is, you know, they've got all these cool features, but they're also going to allow the old implementation on Ethereum to still utilize it, which then means because Ethereum's EVM, we could also use it on Avalanche. Awesome. Uh, that's going to be really, really cool. Uh, looking forward to seeing all of the different use cases that come from, from this uh, standard. I imagine if, uh, if there was some sort of a, uh, a pool that somebody could deposit their NFTs into or their tokens or some, some smart contract that somebody could just mint one of these tokens. It would be a great, great help if they don't want to like have to manage each one, just put it all into one token. Yeah. That's the thing. I think, you know, DeFi for so long or even now it's like, it, it's not uh, friendly to non-technical people. Like and having these types of standards allows us to kind of hit that mass adoption. Well, this is an example, right? So like recently uh, in the last month or so, I think I was moving uh, a bunch of uh, assets from one wallet to another wallet. Mm. And, you know, it would have helped if I could have just put it into one of these and just sent one transaction, you know, or do two, two transactions or however many, like it'll just less transactions than I had to do, <laughs> which, yeah. which were a pain because I mean, the, the current gas fees with the, with the, uh, the volumes in Krabada are painful at times. Yeah, that's it. I mean, even like other use cases, like, you know, like privacy, right? So currently like Sherpa or like Tornado, you know, you, you have a whitelisted set of tokens. If you could privatize an ERC-1155, you'd privatize your whole portfolio, right? Um, so now instead of like, because currently what happens if people want privacy on the blockchain, right? They've got to convert into AVAX. Uh, then they're going to take that AVAX to like Tornado or Sherpa, deposit it there, wait a week or two, and then, you know, withdraw it. Now you've got anonymity on a new wallet, but, you know, you had to go through AVAX. You probably had to convert your portfolio into AVAX. You probably might, might have lost a bit of yield while you were doing that, um, like while you're waiting for the week to elapse. So it's not a very elegant process at the moment um, to get private to get privacy. So another use case was also the bridge to secret network. Like let's say I wanted to bridge to secret network, which is, you know, it's a Cosmos based chain that um, actually does some very interesting stuff. What it does is it's both using similar technology to uh, what the, a the Avalanche bridge uses, which is SGX. Um, so what secret does is it actually allows um, yet yeah, uh, private transactions of smart contracts which is actually very, very interesting. I think like I haven't seen anyone else doing what they're doing. Um, but now imagine you wanted to, let's say for example, you know, you wanted a bit of yeah, travel money or whatever, right? You wanted a bit of money that you're going to Barcelona and you didn't want, you know, maybe people understanding, I don't know, maybe you went to the pub and you didn't want your missus knowing you drank 20 beers. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, maybe you wanted a bit of privacy, like, you know, so, so one of the things I thought about was you could, you could just take a, a 1155, take all your tokens to secret, get it anonymized, get some yield on secret. And then when you need it, you could just bring it back. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the, the privacy, privacy technology is really interesting for me. Like, I think that's really important. What up, Steven? Hey, How Steven. guys? I like the shirt, man. Or is that a jacket? Or you look yeah. like a Cobra Kai. <laughs> <laughs> Getting Cobra oh, no. Kai, Cobra Kai vibes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
we were just talking about uh, this uh, token standard because uh, we I brought up Efinity, which was a it's a project being built by Engine. Um, they're creating a new token standard, which Justin was kind of going through, called a yeah, power token. Fifty fives like um, like uh, wallets without addresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I love that concept. That like kind of like a dead, almost like a system wallet that you can interact with, but no one actually owns it. It's so interesting. Like um, um, my like question that I would probably need like a you know dev mind to really answer to. Maybe it's a Justin question at the end of the day. It's like, is the tooling? that's already there for wallet infrastructure going to work if like the wallet doesn't have an address always, you know, like, cause like, well, well it, it has an address. It doesn't have a private key. Um, so the thing is, so like, it's like a burner account that's burnt its key. So, so, so think about Sherpa. When we deployed Sherpa, we, we deploy, like we, when I deploy a contract on the chain, I'm the owner by default. So let's say I deploy like a pangolin airdrop or a Sherpa contract, any contract on the chain. If I deploy it, generally, unless I've said it, I'm the owner of that contract. And then what happens is normally I've got to transfer ownership. So generally the way we do it is like we deploy, like for example, with Near or Wagme deployment, which we're, we've been doing this week, is like you deploy it. And then after you deploy it, you change the owner to a multi-sig and you do that so that only the multi-sig really has kind of like advanced privileges. But in this instance, you would have an, it, it would do it automatically. So it would say, okay, deploy this delegate. I think they call it delegate or something, a discrete account. It never has a private key. So even though like you deployed a discrete account, no one really has administrative functions. You can add like do things to it, but it's not like, an account in the traditional sense, right? You see, so they don't have a private key. Right, like you can still go and look at the contract address, so you can still send funds to it. And the cool thing is that like, when you move that contract, it brings the funds with it. What's, wait, so then what's different about this, like 1155 than a normal contract? Well, well 1155 is an EVM compatible, um token standard right so what that means is it allows 1155 allows it's a basket of goods so let's say for example you know am i sharing my whole screen or just like let me just open a new notepad yeah okay so let's say i've got a portfolio right so justin's portfolio and i might have like i don't know 100 bucks in ust you know like i might have a, like 50 pnp and then I might have, like, I know someone gave me, like, a Sherpa NFT. I've probably got quite a few Pangolin NFTs. Um, and then, you, you know, and then maybe I've got, like, I don't know, like, uh, maybe I've got a Thief IDM. I think it's called IDM. So now I've got all of this stuff, right? It's in my MetaMask wallet. And they're each individual tokens. So these are ERC20. And these are all ERC721, but they're all actually individual, right? Like, so, like, I, like, let's say, for example, like, I don't know, let's say I was giving up on DeFi, right? Like, people were swearing at me and I got, like, over it, <laughs> you know, I started people and I was like, okay, I'm out. But I want to take all my funds and I want to give it to, like, charity or I want to give it to my mates before, like, I take a break and go sailing right as an example now i could say oh yeah grand well this is one two three four five i'd go into metamask i then have to manually transfer all five of those to the charity i was donating them to or i could put them all into like a like a erc 1155 and it consists of all of them so it's one token that then has all of that within it so it's a basket so now I can just say, send all of them, one transaction. It's also much more gas efficient. So if you if I'm sending all of these manually, I'm probably getting, I don't know, depending on the gas fees on Avalanche, I'm probably getting 20 buck, uh, twenty cents to a dollar. Shit, I think I got hit 20 bucks the other day for something. Um, but like now there's five transactions instead of one. So you, 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 you at the very minimum, you're getting like a 25 or more. You're getting a good discount. 
Isn't the real value in it? Or, oh yeah, go ahead for it. Go for it, Christos. No, go ahead, but you go ahead. Do you think go that ahead. the real value in the eleven fifty five is in like the multi transfer? Because like um you would probably need to add those things to the eleven fifty five. Yeah. That's the thing. So this is where I think user experience comes into it. I think what you'll have is, well, my hope is wallets will embrace it. So what will happen is when you have a wallet and you go to a DEX and you swap, it then just, you could have a tick box that says, add it to my ERC-1155. So then, it, because you, what you want, it's a whole like, you know, cure is better than a remedy or cure is, uh, or prevention is better than a cure. Um, so like what you want to do is you want people the default to be to keep these tokens in a in a in a in a basket. Now the problem with that is imagine you did that at Pangolin, right? So let, let's say at Pangolin you go, there's a tick box that says on the swap widget, it says transfer to eleven five five. Then what'll happen is you, you you buy some UST and immediately it goes into this uh one one five five. The issue is broader adoption. There's not now nah, how do you as a user when you want to kind of use one of those tokens send it the tooling hasn't caught up and that's one right. of the big what issues. Tooling limitation. What are like before I, I want to ask like what some of the limitations of the tooling are, but um like I mean for anyone listening, this is maybe where we're we're having this idea, but like the uh what if like just like LP tokens go into like your LP wallet? It's like a sub wallet within your you know, you know, like uh, Christos is zero X one two three four five. You know, check him out. Now he's doxxed. And the um, the um, and the you know, like he has like a sub wallet, which is this like ERC eleven fifty five that has his like you know, uh, you know, like fee for Imperium Empires or you know whatever like NFT is in it. And um, you know, maybe like that helps from an organization perspective if it was like the default for like Pangolin to drop things in there, like with LP tokens and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um we could help like organize things and then if christos wanted to like you know move wallets to metamask or quickly move them over to his ledger for high security or something like that maybe um we'd be empowering people to more seamlessly move around maybe some sort of reputation could be even baked into that like uh 1155 as like a passport or something that, that that's it uh, my, my concern though is if we adopt it and no one else adopts it then we're adding extra steps. So let's say, for example, like, you know, we adopted a pangolin. Now someone has this basket and they want to kind of use, a, let's say now they want to swap a, like one of the tokens in that basket. So if other DEXs don't support it, they're going to have to transfer that token out into like a normal, like out into their wallet and then swap. So then we've added an extra work when we're trying to. So this is where standards come into it, right? Like this is why like standards are important and you want mass adoption so that like because we don't want to create a experience that is unique to pangolin but then creates hard we know so this is an interesting thing that i've been thinking about a lot like right is like we don't want to ever be excluding people from doing something so like i'll give you an example and maybe i like but like in pangolin like we want to say okay no matter what token you want to trade like we don't care if we've got liquidity cool but like we don't want to like we don't want to exclude anyone, right? So if 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 we don't have liquidity for a token and you want to trade it, we believe that you should still be able to trade it through our front end. You shouldn't have to go somewhere else. Whereas other people or other projects, you know, they they've got a slightly different approach where you know they kind of like they don't that they, they force you to only use their walled garden, as it were. So for us or for me personally, is I think ERC one one five five is the future. But until more people adopt it, it could be it could actually be exclusionary and prevent people from uh, interacting with DeFi uh, effectively. So then, so then it's like, okay, what do you do? I, I don't know. It's a hard problem. Well, here, here's a, a question: Could you? Does it? So it only holds ERC twenties and ERC seven two ones and. So out of curiosity, say, for example, uh, a project team of some DAP wanted to create their own ERC-1155, but it contained 
either LP tokens or uh, some tokens that are already producing yield. Mm -hmm. Could you do that? Because then, yeah, yeah. then what you could do is you could have like, this is proper DGEN talk now, but you could have yield within the token and then you could stake the ERC-1155 uh, and get even more yield. Could that I feel work? like the other analogy that like you're, yeah, like the way you're talking about that makes a lot of sense. Like it would literally be a way to back an NFT with tokens. It would literally be that the tokens are in the NFT. It's almost like a folder, right? Like I think that's yeah. like really what 1155s are. It's like, you know, like you, you, your desktop might look like mine, like, you know, once a month and then I clean it up, right? But like the, like, you know, it's just like just all this stuff. And they're like, what's the value of a folder is like kind of like what I'm like debating right now. But I think you could also do other things with it. Um, that are it's like that's the uh, design opportunity or like see what like new primitives it creates but like you know if like we if like you know christos makes a nft um and then you want it to be backed by like 100 png the png could literally just be in it and, and you've probably got some interesting like yield opportunities if you get in yield let's say yeah you get in like i don't know 16 percent on that, you know, you're probably getting, I don't know what the latest is on that, 15%, you know, you're probably not getting anything, any yield on that. But then like, if you got a basket, you know, could you then get yield on top of that? Like, let, I mean, this goes into that whole D hedge, um, you know, kind of like, if you look D, I don't know, I haven't looked at D hedge, but I don't know if they're using ERC-115 in the background. They might be actually. I don't think they're using NFTs though, so probably not. So if you look at D Hedge, it's like a decentralized hedge fund manager. Very cool protocol, actually. Like, um, like pretty unique in what they do. And what they do, I think it's only on Ethereum and Polygon. Oh, just as an aside, you saw Polygon went down. Like, I wonder if they back up. Did it? Uh, yeah. Um, a chain yeah. halted like three hours ago. I think they might still be down. Anyway, just an aside. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So. So what these guys do is you can create a strategy and then people can invest in your strategy, right? So if you look at, they've got like a percentage return, but these strategies consist of like a basket of items. So if you look here, this one here, Convex Strategies has SBTC, it has SETH and SUSD. And this is the percentage it's been made up of. So now this is what is traditionally called an index fund, right? Um, it's, it's a basket. Uh, so, but what 1155 allows even more is you can also add NFTs to this. So imagine you added a board, uh, like a board ape or something to this, right? Like now you've got all of this in a basket that then other people could potentially also own a share of or invest in. Um, so I don't know if they use, I don't think they use 1155 in the background. I think they just use probably a custom smart contract. But if we move to standards, then like more protocols would be able to do this, right? Because it would become a standard that was used throughout DeFi. Because you couldn't like tokenize a wallet, a normal wallet, right? Like that would, or I don't know, maybe there's still a way to do that. But like, you know um justin is this ledger legendary like crypto fund manager hedge fund manager and you know like you're doing it with your own wallet but like if you did something like this where um i'm not sure how the hedge works inside out but like you'd have like your folder of like assets right and like strategies right like they could be lp tokens they could be like you know you could be doing all sorts of stuff mm. and then like you could are you suggesting that like then you could like tokenized ownership of that folder, like of that 1155? You think that's what's going on? Or like your idea for uh, like what you were almost hoping D-Hedge was doing? I, I, I don't think D-Hedge is using um, 1155. I think what they're doing is they've got a smart contract. Uh, when you create a strategy, it then like it creates a unique contract that uh, controls your strategy and it has like functions for invest in. So then if I invest in this one, for example, by Guntus, my money goes into the smart contract that Guntus uh, created, which includes these. And Guntus can then change the allocation of tokens in that contract. I don't think they use no 1155 because 1155 doesn't have the concept of uh, delegate or invest on behalf of. 
because so that's an important one, right? So the thing is, if you're going to invest in this dude's portfolio, you need to be able to make sure that first of all, you can send him money. So let's say I want to take a hundred bucks and throw it into, so currently he's managing 810,000. So if I wanted to invest a hundred bucks, that smart contract would have to accept my money. And then when it was uh, processing profits, it would have to be able to distribute those profits. So I actually don't think there's an ERC or an EIP standard that dictate, but I mean, it's quite like it, it would almost be like your NFT royalty standard. You would take, and there might be one for a one, one, five, five, which would actually be very interesting because the way NFTs work is, you know, obviously if you sell an NFT, then the artist gets like a percentage, like 5% on every sale, things like that. So there's a standard that defines that. So you could define a standard for 1155 that sits on top of it that then defines investment and profit share. Because that's what it's what that's what you're doing. You're saying, I trust this dude to manage my money, although I probably wouldn't be trusting him recently. Um, and then like if he makes money, like I should get a bit of that profit. It's interesting. Um, there's actually a weird thing about NFTs that like maybe this hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking out loud here, but the like when you have like uh, something like Safe Moon, where it's like every single transaction, like ten, there's a ten percent tax on that transaction, and that gets like paid out, however, to like holders or um, that's like what I thought of when I thought of royalties for NFTs. But like the royalties standard for NFTs isn't like really enforced by the contract, um, and like. The re there's a reason why because like if you have a hundred um of the like you know png token and, and like you know if there was like a reflection built into it such that like 10 percent of every transfer like that 10 you know, so you were sending 10 tokens like you know um justin sent 10 png to crypto it's like what if like 10 percent of one png like got like you know uh distributed to all png holders the that could be enforced in the transfer function but like with an nft you can't like break off a little piece of it that's like by definition what is unique about it so like if you like the the actual like paying for the nft and the nft moving are two separate transactions so like i could buy an like a piece of art from you in the normal world for 100 bucks and then like pay you tomorrow right so how on earth would like the smart like the blockchain like know that i paid a hundred dollars for that and not like you know uh i don't know like a, you know a soccer ball or whatever it is right um that next day yeah it's a it's a great question i mean and that's why marketplaces implement that right so um they would have their own set of smart contracts like open ocean um Kalao, all of them they would implement the smart contracts that enforce the payment of those elements so i think er so nfts is 721 i think the royalty is like a different standard like a different number yeah i think i've seen it before it's like 2278 or something like that but the um like whatever uh just look up like nft royalty standard and you'd find it the yeah. um the, i think i needed to go one step further with that thought though i was just trying to show the break in the chain with the nft transferring and then like more or less that standard is like you know it's kind of like there and it's like if an if a marketplace is facilitating both sides of that transfer they can enforce it right yeah so you're kind of just saying like you know like with that standard you're kind of saying like please pay a royalty to this address and this amount when a trade's made um but it kind of just like needs to you have to trust it you could always get around that if yeah. you're doing peer, peer stuff but like if you had like a folder you could have like an erc 20 uh, and when you transfer that folder, the ERC-20 could be like a guaranteeably paid royalty. So if you backed your asset with some sort of um, like ERC-20, now you're starting to open up like some like a uh, verify, like, you know, like a verifiable like guarantees of like those royalties being paid. Mm, I agree. And, and, you, and you can do the check on the, you can do the check on the, the basket, right? So before you buy this, do you have enough money to cover both the sale and the NFT? Like, and it can distribute it automatically. So your your, your design space, you, you get you you get more flexibility. So that's the thing. ERC twenty is great as a building block. ERC seven twenty one is great as a building block. But that's what's so beautiful about DeFi. Once you start stacking these things together, the the sum is greater than the the parts. 
I love it. I'm like doodling folders on my notebook over here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a cool one. Um, I still like wanted to double click on the affinity thing though, and like uh, what you see going on uniquely there. So, so fuel tanks for me is the killer feature. Like, I mean, again, I, like probably more will jump out at me, but w w when when I read this, fuel tanks just jumped out at me immediately. Um, it's you know, so like economy does too it's like you could like pre-allocate gas exactly so 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 let, let, let's talk about a, like a common use case so let's look at camelot right so camelot is like a proposal to create like a subnet that then runs arbitrage bots okay so the thing is these arbitrage bots would need to then have gas so let's say for example there's 10 arbitrage bots hopefully it would be fully decentralized and there'd be more but for the purposes of this, let's say there's 10 arbitrage bots. Now, these arbitrage bots run both arbitrage strategies and they validate this Camelot subnet. Now, what happens is in a traditional, like, I guess, not traditional, but the current state of affairs is each valid, each arbitrage bot would be in charge of paying their own gas. So let's say I'm arbitrage bot A, I see that there's maybe a thousand dollar difference between Bitcoin on Ethereum and Avalanche or between the C chain and a subnet. Wow. I then take, I then need to execute that. So let's, if I'm an arbitrage bot, I'm going to then have to execute a trade on the C chain and I'm going to have to execute a trade on Dexalot as an example to take the trade, right? But now I've got to, I've got to have gas. So I've got to pay the gas and each individual uh, arbitrage bot has to be manage their own gas output, right? So they've got to make. So this is what happens with us at at, at Pangolin. You know, we've got to constantly top up uh, bots. So we're like, oh shit, the gas ran out. Oh shit, okay, throw it like another ten other bucks. You know, keep it running for a while. So you've got to constantly keep the lights on. Whereas with a fuel tank, and what what's the point of a Camelot subnet, right? The point of a Camelot subnet is to share the wealth across a bunch of people. So you want to share the wealth, you should probably also share the expenses. So, you know, so then what you do is if you had all of these 10 arbitrage bots, you'd have a fuel tank where only they would be whitelisted. So they would be able to use any gas within that fuel tank, but only for the purposes you specify. So I wouldn't be able to take that gas and go speculate and go like stake it, uh, but I would be able to use that gas to pay for arbitrage opportunities. So now there's a shared pool of this gas. So then all of the profit would then be profit and it wouldn't have to worry about gas. Also, you can do some funky things where, and I think you're going to see a lot of this in the upcoming years, is just like in traditional markets, you have futures and hedging against oil, uh, against the commodity market. I think you're going to see that with gas. So DAOs that provide <laughs> features that are heavily gas heavy, are actually going to start pre-purchasing. Like, let's say, for example, I think, yeah, we're going to do a million like premium apps to your users, right? Like, you know, if like you want to cover the cost of gas, like if it's, you know, you're going to be able to attract users and like, you know, make that, that experience like totally seamless for them. Like if you look at ETH, there's like a gas token. So what these guys do is, you, you know, they take advantage of a storage refund to get you. So they'll actually try to save you gas. So I think you're going to, I mean, this is actually a pretty cool thing. And I think, you know, like, so, so with Camelot, I'll use Camelot as an example. If we think we're going to be spending, you know, the arbitrage bots are going to be doing a thousand transactions a day. And that's a cons very conservative. So that's a thousand gas transactions a day. So if you could save like 5% on all of that, you get huge savings if you can optimize. So then what you would do is Camelot, you'd get the validators that are running Camelot to all kind of like when gas was cheap, they'd want to, you, you'd want to stock up on the gas so that when gas was expensive, you could use your cheap gas. So that's kind of what these guys do, right? So, and that's kind of what happens in like traditional markets, right? So like what will happen is these guys will hedge against weather conditions. So let's say for example, you know, weather conditions affect a lot of commodities. So they'll hedge their bets that if there's going to be crazy weather, like in New York, right, when it's cold as shit, right, like you guys all have to have heaters. So then theoretically you, you make sure you, you, you're covered for when the weather is crazy. And, and, and you, 
hundred percent is going to happen on blockchain and it's going to become a very mature secondary market. It's interesting. Yeah. Arbitrage on the gas opportunity, right? Yeah. yeah. That's a bar gas when it's cheap and then use it when it's expensive. Like, well, sorry, that's probably the wrong way to put it, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, if you, want, you want to accumulate it so that like you kind of, yeah, can always save money. Um, like auto compounders, right? Like if you look at auto compounders, they spend heaps. Uh, someone was telling me something like 10K or I don't know, 20K um, for, for like a, a fairly popular auto compounder. They spend in that a month, you know, that's, you know, a quarter of a million, maybe half a million dollars a year. If you can shave off like 20% of that, those profits can go back to your users, right? So this is a cool thing about DeFi, right? So like if you can be... I'm quite financially prudent. Um, so the thing is, but in DeFi, if you can be financially prudent and you can direct those savings back to your users, well, the hope is that your users get the benefit of that. More rich system. Yeah. That's the hope. A dollar saved is a dollar earned. Exactly right, man. Like, and people in this industry are so blase about spending money, man. Like, and now it's starting to really hit a lot of projects. Like, yeah. So the big play, like, with Affinity is, I mean, it's it's out of engine. And you, that's why you were talking about the ERC-1155 standard, because engine created the ERC-1155 standard. They must have been seeing around some corners, because their whole thing was about being a um, you know, fundamental NFT infrastructure platform. I think that they were so early that maybe they didn't know exactly how the NFT ecosystem would evolve because so much of it just gets forked from place to place. I, I think they assumed that there were certain pipes that were going to be needed in the NFT ecosystem and they would sort of own some of the pipes. Um, I'm really curious to understand what Affinity ends up being then because like, I think they're clearly showing ability to, um, you know, see into the future of um, the ecosystem by creating standards that have been so widely, um, well, maybe not so widely adopted, but I think people are starting to notice them. Yeah, I think it's, uh, th that's the thing in this industry. It's, it's those who can predict it will own it. Because if you think something's going to happen and you do it six months to a year before everyone else and you can get adoption, well, then you become the de facto, right? Um, and I think that's where engine, because let's be like, I had a conversation, to, like GameFi is still very young, right? Like, but the thing is, if you can create tools for all of these creators coming in, it's like the Unreal Engine of NFTs. So Unreal Engine is used by game developers, right? So like, game developers come in they come into this platform they develop this game on a kind of commonly accepted platform so imagine now you create an nft like this is the thing so my missus she was working on this nft right so she did all the artwork uh now okay well shit now we've got to find a developer now we've got to randomize all of these nfts we've got to then you know go through we've got to get smart contracts you got to do all this stuff as an artist like she doesn't care about that and it's a barrier to entry for her now imagine you go to something like Affinity or Engine and it's NFT um, distribution as a service. So now she's made the artwork. Now she just wants to distribute it. So I, I, that's the way I see Engine and Affinity playing as a, a service for people that want to, first of all, create NFTs and take away some of the pain points and people that want to purchase NFTs and craft NFTs that are kind of cross-chain compatible. And this is also the cool thing about Affinity. It's, it's kind of chain agnostic. So like you could take your NFTs from, I don't know, like Ascenders and then, you know, chuck them in here, like sell them or buy them and then go out and then play them. So like for me, this could potentially be an open C type thing. Um, whereas open C is just a marketplace. This actually, creates a lot more value in my mind, especially, I mean, OpenSea, I mean, regardless of what you think about them, there has been some uh, controversial uh, behavior from some of the, some, some of their team, um, you, you, you know, whereas, yeah. Um, 
it's interesting. You're talking about like front running thing, like one of the guys got let go for. Um, that was sort of unfortunate to see. It wasn't even a huge amount of. It was a big amount of money, but like when you think about the amount of money uh, OpenSea is uh, processing, you think it's like billions a day or something crazy like that now. And um, yeah, but the the like, I'm trying to like so this crafting one that's on this that we're looking at right now. It's like what if you had like a bunch of I was reading the blurb. It's like what if you had a bunch of uncommon or like not rare, less rare um, like things, and you could fuse those into like one super rare sword. Mm. or something like that um but my question on that one is like most of these methods for actually making things end up becoming like open source technology if like people put their smart contracts up so my big question ends up being like why why like why pay for the service when it's like copy pastable there's always going to be a use case yeah. and like it's going to be growing where not everyone wants to be a developer too so it's, it's a great so, 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 so what, what, why is Kravado on a subnet in your mind? Um, well, I'm going to try to ignore like my, like, I think I know where you want to go with it, but the, like, no, no, well, I, choose your guts. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that the, like, I think they're going there to reduce the fees of the ecosystem, really. I think that's one of the core value props. And I think they're also keen to explore um, and like, you know, um, you know, be the first ones to, to like use some of these like new tools in the Avalanche ecosystem. So, so there you go. I think that's right. So, so they, they want to go to reduce fees and to reduce load on the C chain. Um, okay. So the thing is, why would anyone use Affinity, um, you know, versus doing it themselves? So first of all, I mean, fees for NFTs, there's also the collapse of network performance, right? Anytime there's like a new NFT project, um, that there's huge network slowdown, right? So like when I like I think like whenever there's a big popular project and there's a mint going on, gas gas prices spike. So this comes down to kind of generalized versus specialized subnets or network lengths. So let's talk about that a bit, right? So a generalized would be something that does a lot of things, whereas a specialized does one thing very well. So the EVM is a generalized platform okay anyone can write a smart contract um and and that smart contract has a pretty high um kind of design space for what's achievable in it right so if you think about it imagine you had a car and you went to the farm and you wanted to i don't know like move sand you could probably like dig your car in and move it but it would do a shitty job um you know, so <laughs> then, you know like or you could have a specialized tool um, so specialized blockchains, I'm kind of in fact, so, so Affinity is a specialized blockchain, right? It does one or it does maybe three or four things. It doesn't care about, you know, staking. It doesn't care about like creating a smart contract. It doesn't care about a lot of this extra stuff. It does one thing and it wants to do it fast and efficiently. So if you mint and if you mint NFTs on Affinity, it's going to be faster than minting them on an EVM, right? Because it's specialized to do that one thing. Whereas an EVM, it has to take that small contract, it has to decompile it into bytecode, it then has to execute it, and then it has to return it, right? So, and it's general. So like, it's never gonna a general, I mean, there's obviously broader questions, but um, why wouldn't you use this token if it saved you money and it was interoperable on a massive scale? And got you into as many markets as possible um so the thing is that's also the other thing with what we're seeing now is nfts are chain they tied to their chains how many bridges you see that does nfts you're starting to see a few of them but i mean if that's going to be even worse than an erc20 outcome is poor bridging for nfts i mean i think I was, that was, uh, i'm going to speculate here and just like I really should emphasize the speculating part, but like when you're making an NFT, the bridging like is actually very similar and like very, very similar in a lot of ways, but there's like one difference, like I want to flag. And it's like, no one, no one knows or cares. Like, like let's say there's, you know, a billion of a token that we just created. It's the cash token. And like the, you know, cash token is like, there's a billion supply. 
Um, no one cares if they have cash token number, you know, four, five, six. Like, yeah. in fact, it's not even like a part of the token. It doesn't like know its number. It doesn't have a number. But the, yeah. like, you know, they're, I think if you like, I'm scrolling around on this affinity page and it's like they, you know, if you have like four swords, they all might, there might be like a hundred swords, but like four of them are the same, right? They look the same, but they actually do have a number behind them. So they are not interchangeable. Like you could have like a relationship with like, I don't know, you have like Digimon or like Beanie Babies or like a Charizard card or anything like that. It's like you can have a relationship with like this one particular one. It's like the edges frayed or something, right? And it's like number 101 versus 102. Um, you know, it's like seeing some things with you. Like with when you're like bridging now, like that like one of one nature of like an NFT, even if there are similar ones to it, like there is like only one that, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, sword number five. Mm-hmm. So like when you're bridging, uh, this is a weird space, but like you can like, if, if it's on like Ethereum and you like move the sword into like, you know, that like locker and it comes out on the other side, like you're, you're just saying like, here's a list of like, if there's 10,000 of the swords, some of them are in the locker and have like come out on the other side. So I almost think it's smoother in some ways with NFTs. Because it's like a one to one thing. There is a one to one tie every single time. But can I can I give you an analogy? Yeah, like, and so I so I watched the big short recently, like I watched it every <laughs> few years. Like um and, and and they talk about the Jenga pile of like triple a b and all these ratings of elements right and then what happens is once you take out the jenga then everything kind of collapses so with nft and bridges so let let's say I t- i've got an nft i minted it on ethereum i then bridge it across to avalanche so now i've actually created a derivative you know, because the, it, it's still the original contract is still on Ethereum. So now I've got a synthetic representation. I then take that Avalanche NFT and I bridge it to, I don't even know, man, Polygon if it's up. <laughs> um, and I, now I've got another representation, right? So I've got another derivative on a derivative. Now I move from Polygon, I move that to Terra. Now I've got another derivative, right? So now you've got derivatives on derivatives on derivatives. What happens is what happens what happens if someone pulls that Jenga out on Avalanche? The it's like a house of cards, and this is kind of what scares me about bridges. Is I do think they share some characteristics of the subprime housing crisis. Um, I could be completely full of shit, but I do see similarities. Yeah, there's definitely the- similarities there. Go like on. I've I I've had a challenge with this. Like even with the folding strategy, sometimes I'm 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 thinking, at some point you're you're basically recreating uh, derivative upon derivative before. I mean, in the case of loans, you just liquidate yourself, so it's fine. Mm. But with a bridge, everybody's affected, and yeah, then you're perhaps potentially affecting other chains as well. Exactly. So, so let, let let's look at the big short of blockchain. Imagine, like, I, 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 imagine you have this mature ecosystem, like Axelar. Like, I don't want to say, it, like, I love Axelar, but imagine Axelar goes down, like, but down, like proper down. Like that means every single UST will have a run. It'll it'll be a run like you've never seen before. Well. Maybe you, I think you saw there was a black swan a while ago. It was a compound. But anyway, like, um, this is, honestly, it is what scares me about bridges. Because also the thing is that they're honeypots for attack. I think NFTs are slightly different because you're going to lose your NFTs. But hopefully then theoretically, you still have ownership on the source chain. But these are kind of attack vectors that I think, this is why, like, you know, I'm shouting for atomic swaps. This is why I'm so, like, um, rightly or wrongly, like pushing for atomic swaps because atomic swaps is none of this, right? It's, 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 there's none of this wrap, there's none of this extra stuff. The risk vectors reduce. Um, and look at the biggest hacks. Like, I, I mean, I don't know, like always bridges, always bridges. 
poly network, mm. wormhole, centralized. I don't know what the other ones were, but yeah, the top two are bridges. And this is before bridge mm -hmm. wars have really kicked off, yeah? So, I mean, we, we're not really in the heart of the bridge wars. I think we've probably got another three to four months before the bridge wars really start kind of raging. Is, is like the swaps that you can do uh, on the primary subnet and avalanche between the XC and P chain, are those counted as atomic swaps or no? <sighs> Great question. I actually spoke to this very cool dude yesterday, and basically they have another instance of level DB on the XP and C, and that keeps a record of all, it's, I think it's even called atomic swap or something, and that keeps you a record. Down. You said level DB, and I, I oh. admitted they have no idea what that means. <laughs> so so it, 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 it's the database used in the Avalanche Go client. So mm, it's okay. basically a database. It's how they persist data, and, and yeah. yeah. So it's a state. Um, so yeah, definitely. That's between the X, C, and P chain. They've got that, but there's that 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 doesn't extend to subnets. I'm not sure if they are extending it to subnets. It's hard to know. So, so that means you you. Pro Go ahead. No, yeah, totally do it. I'm gonna doodle something so I can make sure I can get my. So so out. okay. So so then, as I understand it, then within a subnet you could have multiple shards which could be like the blockchains so the block each blockchain is essentially kind of like a sh uh, this is how i understand shards because i see shards as blockchains whereas the subnet is like a it's another network which any chain and any chain within exactly a, a subnet is a collection it's a, it's a group so yeah. that's why the primary chain has three block blockchains in it right so then what I'm trying to understand then is um, why would Krabata need a whole subnet that they, I, they will likely make more sense to actually use that subnet for multiple chains for different games because I mean, you're going to need, aren't they going to, well, they don't need to be decentralized, do they? Well, so, well this um, is the, the, the reason they're doing it is because they're going to save their users gas fees. And mm -hmm. it's going to take off network load from the C chain. So it's going to make the C chain faster and cheaper. Those are the two major benefits that I see. At the, and then the, the con that I see is for a fragmented ecosystem um, and, and, and uh, confusion for users. It's actually going to make it harder to play Krabada. Because think of the steps you need to play take to play Krabada. You've got to get AVAX. You've got to get AVAX from a centralized exchange. So fiat to AVAX, AVAX into the actual C chain. Then from the C chain, you've got to then get your CRA or your TAS or whatever. And then from there, you've got to go from the C chain to the swimmer network. So like, you got to think now nah, that that's a big uh, burden for new users into the space. Like if I'm a player, like I want to go to a game and it's like, okay, he has a hundred bucks, take my credit card, let's play. Um, now you've introduced like significant kind of, yeah, over overhead. Um, yeah. But to go further, so like, because the way I see subnets is that each subnet has a, a primary focus, but within that focus, you can have multiple chains, like the way we have the X, P, and C in uh, the primary network. So, yeah. and what I'm trying to figure out is, because I know DeFi kingdoms are also going to be uh, building a subnet. In my mind, I'm like, why, why don't the games to come together in one subnet so then their communities come in you have more validators because they're going to need they're going to need validators of that subnet because they don't actually assume the security of, of the primary network they, they they boost the security of the primary network by by adding a validator this is how i understand that well, but no, they don't no. assume the no so or, 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 or so to be a validator of a subnet you have to be a validator on the primary chain or the primary subnet yeah this is what i mean so oh. so you're 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 validating the primary chain, but validators from the primary chain are not all validating your subnet. No, no, it's permissioned, right? So the thing is, like, for Krabada to be, I just need to check, I've got to meet him, but I'm enjoying this. Um, okay, I can be a little late. Um, like, so, okay, so this is the whole thing, right? So this is actually, it's, it's a very interesting topic. So, like, the way I see it is, first of all, it's permissioned, right? So, like, if I want to be a, a Krabada validator, I don't just get to go, yeah, cool, sign me up, like, 
you know, I have to probably reach out to the project team. I have to be whitelisted. There's a bunch of stuff. So I'm actually not inheriting the full security of the chain because if I was inherit, if, if that network or subnet was inheriting the full network security, it would be inheriting every validator, but it's only actually inheriting a subset. So while it is secure, it's actually, it's never going to be as uh, secure as the primary subnet. Um, and so this is this is something that I'm wrestling with is so let's say for example I create a subnet and they make the P chain or validation permissionless in the future. Does that subnet need to be upgraded to take advantage of that feature? That that that's an interesting one for me. Another thing that you mentioned, which I think is super like like I think you're on hundred percent on the right track, is Krabada teams up with DeFi Kingdoms. What they would need is they'd need another blockchain. Let's call it a public good blockchain that actually did things that they needed. So it did things like allowed them to atomic swap amongst themselves. Um, it provided services such as message passing between the two for cross-chain communication, cross-chain function calls. So you'd actually like maybe you'd want like another service that like when uh, load is very high on one, they could outsource that load to a public good that then would take away the computational power for a fee. And then like so that the you so I love public good blockchains like I, like I, I really do, because I think, you know, what happens is in these situations with these projects is they do need public goods and infrastructure. And why would you want a game producer building infrastructure? Again, it comes back to specialization. They should focus on building games. Like that's, that's the better the games are. And then infrastructure should be purely specialized on infrastructure. Yeah. So would that make sense then? So if you had a, uh... Okay, because, okay, like we've just established that they only get, they only assume the security of a subset of validators from the primary chain, right? Mm. But each subnet itself doesn't have a limit of how many validators they can create over a number of months or years, right? No. As I understand? I that, no? I don't, have a limit? I don't think, I don't think there's a, there might be a, a a numerical limit based upon uh, computational power. Um, so like, mm. uh, but I don't think so. No, um, not, not, yeah, I'd need to go in deeper. There's just an administrative so, effort that have to go on the P chain and whitelist. Right. Yeah. Cause I'm just trying to understand. I'm, I'm trying to understand this better because as I understand there's, if there's no, okay. Atomic swaps yet or, or will there ever be, I don't know, but between subnet to subnet, but you can have atomic swaps between blockchains within a subnet. Mm. So I was thinking, well, if people love Gamify, then you have one Gamify subnet and then you have another subnet for, I don't know, like some other purpose with different chains doing different things and specializing in, in different areas. I'm trying to understand how this can be used. Like, do, like does one project really need a whole subnet for what it wants to do is what I'm trying to understand. Uh, I'm biased, right? You, you, you know, yeah. um, so you always got to take what I say with a pinch of salt. If I was building a game and me and Steven have talked about this a bit, um, it, it, I, I don't know if I'd use the EVM. Like, you know, so the thing is, like, I would want to, if, I, if I'd want to build a triple A game, you know, which would then probably rely on Unreal. So I would probably build a customized uh, VM that then could take advantage of that. And literally it would just be, the state from the um, game would then be the state of the EVM or oh, the VM, sorry, because yeah, I, I actually don't think EVM is really the best uh, framework for gaming personally. Um, so, so yeah, like, and this is, yeah, that's that. that so I, again, I don't, I don't, I don't think Krabata def, Krabata does need it an extra subnet just because of the the volume of their transactions if yeah, they don't use just 15 percent of the entire avalanche networks transactions are, are kerbada transactions right now so like they they did say with the swimmer network that they do plan to have other games on there and i think that they would um you know like if if the tusk token was gas for other games effectively they would be helping to appreciate one of or like create more utility for uh, one of their game assets. 
So it is opening up new business models for them to do that. Um, and I think it is probably the right solution right now for their game, which is on Avalanche currently. Um, but then, you know, we're gonna have to see what happens with like, where, do you still trade on the C chain? You know, if you want to trade TUS, um, mm. you'll probably see it native TUS on Swimmer Network, I'm guessing, I'm speculating. And then like, you know, that's gonna have to be bridged over. They'll make a connection to that. Uh, yeah, it should be interesting to see how it evolves though. Super interesting. And this is where like, you know, I think like you have public goods, right? So let, let, let's look at Grabada. Like a public good they would need is probably bridging infrastructure because that's the best we have at this stage. So, you know, should Grabada be building bridge infrastructure? I'd argue no. Uh, they'd need probably um, uh, they, they'd need liquidity infrastructure. So um, you need liquidity depth so that traders can obviously get your token and, you know, trade in and out. Um, so there's all these kind of, I don't know if liquidity is a public good. Uh, maybe it will be construed as a public good one day. But this is where I think there's a big opportunity in Avalanche subnets. Because if you can solve these issues, you're going to help all of these projects. Like, um, because, yeah, they, they need it, right? Like, the thing is, what you want, like, I'll say it again, you know, you want your game developers focusing on games, not infrastructure. Yeah. My last question uh, was just the thing. No, you, you have to go this time. <laughs> go, go, go ahead, bro. I went last. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I still like there's like pooled liquidity. There's like, you know, like the our model where they're kind of like a separate chain in the middle where the liquidity pools. Like normal, like Avalanche Ethereum bridge is like there needs to be like some pooled liquidity on either side. I don't know if I can share my screen or not. It would be like, and then like, um, Atomic though, like I don't know if I have a good like mental model for it, honestly. Like they're okay. like I just made like a grid, and I was like, you know, like there's the P chain, the C chain, and the X chain, and then like you know, there's assets on rows, so it can only be in one of the three columns at any point in time. Is that what makes it atomic, or am, so I, let, am I like? Let, let, let's use a real world analogy. Let's say I send like I don't know like. Uh, a phone to Christos. I, I post it to him in in the mail, and Christos gets the phone. Okay, so he's actually received the phone. That's an atomic swap. Otherwise, I take a photo of my phone and I email it to Christos, and I say, "Yeah, he has a phone, mate." Like you got to trust that I still have it, and maybe I'll give it to you in Barcelona. But you got to trust me. Like maybe in Barcelona, I go like, "Oh, sorry, mate. Like, you know, I don't feel like giving it to you anymore." Um, <laughs> but like. Yeah, maybe that might not be the best analogy, but an atomic swap is non-revertible, right? So the thing is, it's it's there's a proof, it's it's non-revertible. There's no taxi backsies. Like once Christos has it, he's got it. Whereas if it's a bridged, it's a wrapped version. You're trusting the security of the bridge. You're trusting both sides of the bridge. So even though you have this wrapped version on the Krabada subnet, if that bridge goes down on the C chain, well, it's actually not tied to anything. It's just in a sea by itself, aimlessly drifting. So, so yeah, atomic swaps are always going to be preferable. I think we have to come up with the the best or find the best visual for. I'm going to read this. The first thing that pops up. Oh well, there's a beginner's guide to atomic swaps from CoinDesk, and there's another another one with the same title from Forbes. I think I know. <laughs> Uh, which one would be more degen? And which one's going to have a paywall? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess just think of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You can, like, like, let, let, like last, last one. I'm happy. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I was, gonna, I was just going to say, so basically, just to come back to that, it, it, it's basically a, a genuine swap. When you swap a token and... It's almost, it almost sounds like bridging is like double spending. It's, 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 it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 like, a, it's uh, basically a non double spend. There's no derivative. It's an actual swap. You, once you send it, it's sent. It's no longer yours. Um, it can only be done it. in the net. It, yeah, it, it, it can only be done in a network, in one network that actually speaks, has components that speak to each other. But when you try and do it from a network to another network, 
there's the, there's the tooling hasn't been built or, or has it? Uh, we've been talking about well, the yeah. power chains. The and wrap tokens don't actually have like a a double sided ledger to them. I guess is that the difference with an atomic well, swap? Like well, the atomic well, swap so, would require a double sided ledger, or what's the? There's a proper accounting term for that. It it, it, it gets complicated. So if you look at the p uh, the p the x and the c chain, the p and the x chain use UTXO, whereas the c chain uses um, I don't know what the term is. So then it's like you, you you've actually got a it becomes very complicated unless it's built at the base level, right? So this is where Cosmos and uh, Polkadot, uh, Cosmos uses RBC, uh, inter-blockchain communication. Chainlink has a standard called, uh, I, I don't know Chainlink's that well, so it, I, I'm probably not the right person to comment on theirs from a fundamental level. It's called CCI, cross chain yeah. And then Polkadot, so the way that like Cosmos and Polkadot work is a modular. So you have a thing for atomic swaps, which is a module, and you just plug it in. So let's say you're building a subnet what what would be the hope would be when you're building it there'd be a module that's called atomic or swaps or whatever and you're just imported as a package into your subnet and that would then give you the functionality to do atomic swaps with all other subnets that's the way that cosmos and uh polka uh have designed their modular blockchain building tools as it were um, because you've got to think, like when you're building a blockchain, you want like a bunch of stuff. You want, if it's proof of stake, you want stake in, you want governance, you want atomic swaps, uh, you probably want like uh, a bunch of other things. So that's, you know, it's the same as if you're building a house, right? You probably need concrete to lay the foundations, you need some walls, you know, you need the electrical wires, you'd need the plumbing, boom, 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 and then you're good to go. Um, yeah uh but i just don't know where we're at with that because uh you need a standard and this is coming back to the standards if you don't have a standard then what's going to happen is everyone's going to invent their own and no one's going to like let's say we invented one well why would i why would trader joe adopt ours they wouldn't they'd be like now we're going to invent our own and like even though like some people think we're enemies I, I don't actually think that i think ultimately you know we're just yeah we if there was a standard we should actually work together for the greater good, you know, like a rising tide lifts all boats kind of vibe. Like if we had like a dope standard that everyone embraced in the ecosystem, it benefits all of us. Like we can't be so self-serving. I was only thinking this earlier, man. I was sitting down and uh, I was thinking, man, if only the DeFi space and crypto as a whole stopped, dropped the whole tribal thing and kind of let go of the competitive thing for a while, we could do so much more, uh, so so much i'm going to use the word damage it's just to to the to the traditional infrastructure we could be a lot more effective in uh, in creating and innovating the space and and everyone benefits if we all just buy into the same the same vision but there's all this fragmentation from that from that competition that competitive mindset which doesn't it doesn't help yeah that's why erp standards right they're so beautiful right it's such an awesome thing that they've done yeah Mm-hmm. yeah so like what i'm trying to understand though is why you, if you wanted to build out other chains and you wanted them to assume the security of all the validators i'm talking about avalanche now right so um mm. i don't know how many validators there are right now if it's 1200 or more um, but I think it's, it's like 2000 ish, maybe I forget. Right. So the C chain, does it actually have all of those validators validating the mm. C chain as well? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because, so, because so, it's part of the primary subnet, right? So it's validating right, the so, primary subnet and the C chain is just a part of the primary subnet. Right. So, so this is what, this is leads to my question. So like, why wouldn't you just, let's say, for example, for Krabata or, or another chain, it doesn't have to be Krabata, but like, wouldn't you just create another blockchain? Um, like, am I understanding that shards are basically just other chains and they're not, they're not the same as subnets? It's actually a 
Great question. So, so shot. I mean, a, a terminology in this space is interesting, right? So, like, it, it, it's beauties in the eye of the beholder kind of thing. One man's interpretation, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, one man's rubbish is another man's treasure kind of thing. So, some people call it a shard, right. and then you'll get some wanker on Twitter saying, "Ah, how dare you!" But like, generally, I think you can <laughs> assume you get to go. I'm sure some technical person will shout about it, but I think you're good. Like using that, yeah. Right. Okay. So. Then I'm wondering, the only reason you'd want to use a subnet, though, is for what we said before, is you would have some specialized area or maybe it's just a network of permissioned chains for different reasons in the regulatory space or something, right? But wouldn't you want the, I suppose, the public chains or the decentralized chains to be in that primary network so that they assume that validator set, which is going to be higher larger number like why would you go and build something that's what i'm trying to understand because with power chains uh, as i understand they're kind of they're assuming the whole network security on all the validator set of polka dot and they're just building separate like each one has its own chain right with its own potentially vm or rule set it, so it's, it's, i'm trying to understand this better it's a brilliant question like it's i don't know a short answer like i mm -hmm. think you spot on though like why would you not just add an extra like blockchain to the primary chain it makes a lot of sense it actually makes so much sense so so the way that mm -hmm. so let me do a comparison between like even even let, 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 let's talk about a polka dot cosmos subnets because those are the kind of competitors you you You'll hear others, but those are the main ones in what you call these layer zero blockchain building platforms, right? Um, so Polkadot, you rent security. So that's why they do their auctions. So you say, oh, yeah, now I'm willing to spend this amount of my token for like two years in order to rent the security from the relay chain. So you rent it, right? But then you get all of the security. You don't get a subset. Polkadot, uh, sorry, Cosmos you have to have your own independent validators. That's why if you actually look at Kepler, I don't know if I'm allowed to, not, I think I should be cool with security. But if you look, let, let's look at the test net of Kepler. All of these chains would have like their own validators. And that's why they're so few, right? So like, I, I, it's not shared security, I don't believe. I believe every, and I could be wrong on this Cosmos. I, I, I'm still learning a lot of Cosmos's insights. But each chain in Cosmos would also have a subset of validators. Um, and mm -hmm. the same thing with Avalanche is that you're never going to get the full security of the network unless every validator opts in to validate your subnet, which seems possible, mm -hmm. but probably not that probable. So you're, you're always, a subnet will always get a subset. So that I guess, yeah, make your own mind. Let, let, let the audience can make their own mind up of which is the better model. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's still early. Like, you know, I, I'm just trying to understand it. I'd love if, <laughs> I don't all, know. Because, like, I don't know if uh, you, you need to have a lot of validators for certain use cases. You might be able to, like, make consensus, like, negotiations and, like, the, like, you know, it's like you're sacrificing security for um, speed or scalability in different ways. And, um, awesome. you know, I think that's the trifecta. So, you, like, all of these things are different, like, um, yeah, they, they have use cases that are like, going to make them. So, 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 so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, put in a contrarian view. You sacrifice uh, decentralization at the expense of freedom. So, and let's look at this, right? So this, this, this has 47 validators. Let's say a government... Oh, no, a sovereign nation. Let's say Russia didn't dig you, right? I don't know. Let's use Russia because everyone hates Russia at the moment, right? Um, <laughs> so, so, no offense. I've got a lot of Russian friends and they're lovely people. Let, let's say yeah, Putin. Let's say, let's, let's, say, let's, say, let's say Putin. Let's just say Putin. Just, just Putin, yeah. <laughs> and and he, he wants to take you down. There's only 47 heads he needs to cut off. Yeah, there was a really oh, interesting thing. We might have referenced this before. This is like a pro avalanche thing for sure. Like Druba, he's like one of the um, core architects or um, engineers at Ava Labs. And I've met him once or twice before and was just like wildly impressed. I think he's like literally in college still, but like 
just like miles ahead of me intellectually. Um, <laughs> it was like analyzing what number of validators control 33% of the stake on different networks. So if you wanted to get 33% of people to collude, you know, how many people do you have to get, right? Um, and uh, for Phantom, it was only three people that you needed to control 33% of the stake. And uh, with Solana, it was 19, and with Avalanche, it was 27. So the, uh, well, I think that size matters in this equation. Um, and, for and, and, and dollar value of the token, because you'd have to have a certain amount of dollar value. I think that's how they calculate it, dollar value to take over a chain. So even because you got to think, let's say, for example, I, I, I only need 20% on Avalanche. I still need the market cap of all of that staked amount. Same with Bitcoin, right? So the, the percentage matters, but the actual dollar figure. So you'd have to own that amount of that token to take it over. So then it becomes an economic question. Hmm. Do you think that they're asking just about like brute forcing it with dollars? Or do you think that they're saying like, what? Hmm. Yeah, I think I might have to come yeah. back to it. Cause, I can cause, share. Cause, cause, cause all of the chat, all of the validators agree on. So there's a different ways on how you agree on what the chain is. So you say the longest chain, I think that's Bitcoin, right? So if it's the longest, then everyone agrees. But then if you own enough, you can agree on what the longest is. I don't know, like probably gonna- Oh, yeah. there's this thing it. called validator weight distribution. If you look at stats.avax.network. Um, also, uh, if you check your telegram, it pings you the link to his Twitter post. He links all three of the Phantom, AVAX, um, Solana, like their, their own first party, like analytics dashboards. I thought this was kind of an interesting thing, but I think it has to do with the weight of the like you know if you if you went after the thirty three biggest yeah validators I mean, on Avalanche, then you would be able yeah. Well, to this get, this is something yeah. that Hassan Hassan has done a lot of stuff to yeah. share to share on this. You know, Hassan. Well, uh, he's Karun the Rich now, <laughs> on, uh, but like the 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 largest uh, validators in the Avalanche ecosystem have a lot of AVAX. Uh, and that's the issue. Like, of course, Phantom and Solana is even worse, but like, if we want to get it to the to the point of better security, you, you want to kind of have a wider distribution. But he's been banging on about that for ages, about different yeah. solutions to this. Since the beginning, he's been better. Since, since Avalanche became a thing, he's been on it. Yeah. You know, like... I don't know, is governance, because governance is still not live, right? Um, I don't remember governance being launched. Uh, and I was waiting for it because I was hoping that there would be a vote to reduce the, the amount of AVEX to become a validator. Um, right. But it hasn't come yet. I think that's something they intend so, to do. But like they're trying to get subnets out so that they can participate in this like layer zero race, right? I feel like that's what's happening here. And then like the... Uh, Avalanche subnets will, you know, maybe have a little bit of like um, room to grow, like technologically. They'll probably be like earlier, like more nascent than some of the other things. But um, the question is if they're benefiting wow. from the their like forefathers, right? Like, are they actually going to Apple everyone? Like, Apple wasn't a first mover ever. Um, mm. but, like, they made sure to learn from what everyone else was doing when they launched stuff. Well, that's, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head. So who are, I think people are looking at Solana and Phantom as Avalanche's competitors. I don't necessarily see that. Um, I think that, I think Avalanche's true competitors are Cosmos and Polkadot. Like, because that's that horizontal scaling, right? Like, because if you win that, you win everything. Like some people, like, because if you can create, yeah, yeah I, I do think if you win that, you, you, you've won. Like no one's gonna touch. We need to get we need to get SEQ on here if he could if he was willing to come on, because yeah. he's done loads of posts on this. Um, like right from the beginning, he he was talk, making comparisons between yeah Avalanche, Polkadot, and Cosmos. Like that's the, the one of the reasons why I came into Avalanche actually, because I was yeah. very much into Cosmos and Polkadot, and I started reading his stuff, and then it kind of attracted me into Avalanche. Um, really be great to kind of get his input on this stuff because he, he seems to have a, a, a foothold and an understanding on on the uh, the, the mechanics 
and, and the different things that set uh, Avalanche apart, for example. Exactly. This is one of the key uh, articles. I mean, it's it, it's pretty old now, um, but the, the, this is a great article. Um, again, I, I started reading him too. He was one of the reasons, like he helped facilitate my journey into Avalanche. So he, he was a great help. Um, yeah, th- th- this is actually a so great article. weird that that's so weird that it's like you look at that and it's like 2020 it's like what it feels like that was only like a few months ago <laughs> DeFi man it's crazy so so yeah th- this is actually a great comparison he's quite complimentary of polka dot in like i remember like seeing some stuff with him we went back and he spoke and he's actually quite what i like about his approach is it's 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 it's, it's not really shaded by um emotional bias it's like he has the stuff like, like, uh, uh, yeah, I think he, um, it's it's good. Like, I, I think his writing is very good. It, it gives you a very nice kind of overview of them. And and, and I do really think that, like, um, this is going to be the major race is between these three. Well, one thing, the good thing about SEQ is that one of the technologies he used to speak about all the time and, and basically shill because he, he was really into it was uh, quants, uh, Quant, uh, mm. which um, is like a sort of like a, a, a chain agnostic connector type of thing. But, you know, he recently dropped that and actually came out and told people like, no, I'm not into this anymore because of the, the new bridging technology. Like, you know, that's coming like XLR and and um, what's the other one called? Uh, layer zero. Chain, yeah, layer zero. So, you know that this guy is a technical dude and he he's he's kind of moving with the times and he's like well this is the best right now and until i get information that proves otherwise you know so yeah this this type of stuff was pretty interesting when i first saw it but Mm. do you think all of this is still completely accurate i'm looking at it now and i've already seen a few kind of um so it's again there's so much nuance in this space bro like the thing is and that's why you get these people on twitter like a like it's it's challenging, right? Because yeah, you like let's go through Avalanche excess of four thousand five hundred per subnet. Okay, so that's that's the upper bound, right? So that's like on a on the X chain you can get that. But as soon as you throw an EVM or any kind of non-trivial uh, VM, uh, that's going to go down. I think that I think the C chain is one five maybe. So I don't know, but but again, it's that's definitely the upper bound for purely and the X chain just transfers tokens. There's no smart contract logic. There's none of that kind of like execution. Um, so, and, and I know Polkadot's fixed a lot of these things. So Gavin Wood is like, <laughs> he's super against uh, regulation. So he's gone through this major change now where he's like, we've got to decentralize everything. And he's just gone like the last few months, he's just gone <laughs> like very full on. So a lot of the stuff is no longer valid. They've also found an improvement to um, the upper bound. I know a lot of people talk about. So there's a few. There's a few fud that that is thrown at all of them. So let, let let's try be de fud all of them. So Cosmos, the fud is that. Uh, what was the fud that someone was showing at me? Like it was something to do with RBC that wasn't actually true. Um, can't remember exactly, but Polkadot, the FUD was that it has 100 uh, maximum uh, parachains within one relay chain. Uh, they've recently solved that. So that, that's not an upper bound anymore. It actually can go a lot more than that, apparently. And Avalanche, the FUD, I've been seeing a lot of weird FUD that it's like, it's just an EVM. Um, I mean, that's kind of bollocks. I mean, you look at Avalanche's consensus mechanism and it, it truly is amazing, like truly. Um, yeah so i think they all offer brilliant things like i really do i think you know and it's going to be very interesting competition's good right um i think it, it hopefully it'll benefit the users if, if if we have this competition absolutely yeah I want the competition yeah, i'm just thinking of this uh this list now <laughs> that'd be cool yeah, this article's great. Just, uh, there's a few inconsistencies, but generally he's spot on. Like, Sek is, like, he, he switched on, dude, like, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm thinking that, because, again, like, just coming back to what we were talking about, and he puts it he puts it in, in, in 
this description up here because he, he says, you know, Polkadot is a heterogeneous sharding platform, which makes sense because it's like a bunch of shards, IC shards as chains. So you could think of each subnet as as a sharding platform because it has multiple ch- shards. So couldn't you just make, because right now the, the subnets that are coming up will be mostly EVM chains, but couldn't you in the future create a subnet that inherits what mm. Polkadot can do. So you have a Polkadot subnet, Polkadot style subnet no. on Avalanche, which assumes the consensus, no? Mm-mm. No, no. Uh, and the okay. reason why okay. is because, and, and, and the same thing for Cosmos, uh, you couldn't. You, so so Terra, for example, um, was probably a good one, but like, uh, because Polkadot, well, first of all, Cosmos uses RBC. So if you, if you wanted to port a Cosmos chain to Avalanche, you'd have to rewrite it. So you'd have to rewrite all of the kind of foundational elements to uh, hook it up to the consensus and you would lose RBC. So you wouldn't be able to have RBC transfers across. With Polkadot, it would be even harder because Polkadot has these public goods. So remember, like people talk about ants, like Avalanche native tokens. So currently, like one of the big issues is if I want to take PNG to the X chain, I can't do that because PNG is an ERC-20 and it can't move across as an Avalanche native token. So Polkadot has this concept of a public good where they create tokens on like statement, which then those tokens can be used throughout the ecosystem. So if you had to create a chain or parrot chain on Polkadot and you used um, statement to create a token, it also has a messaging service called XCMP, which actually then communicates with all of the parachains, and that's how they do atomic swaps. So you wouldn't be able to port a Polkadot parachain to an Avalanche subnet without fundamentally losing most of its functionality. Well, well let me re- let me say it again, what I mean. So I'm not really saying taking an existing parachain. I mean, if you were to take the benefits of Polkadot, like one benefit I can see here is you get 1,500 TPS per parachain. Right mm. now on Avalanche, it says per subnet, but that's that can be interpreted in many ways because you could have a subnet with you know 10 chains potentially. Mm. And if it's 4,500, what does that mean? Each chain has 450 TPS, which is not great. I mean, it's not like as good as it can be, but so th- that's that that's something you need to clarify with the engineers of Avalanche. But mm. 1500 per power chain is pretty good. Um, so I'm thinking, what if you had like somebody rewrite it and they call it Avadot so you can get this <laughs> this potential. I don't know if you could or not, but the reason I'm asking is because it'd be cool to see if you could mix these technologies, take the best from one, mix it with the best of another. Yeah. So <laughs> I had this idea actually um, and I said, because Starport is the best, so, so it's the most used developer-friendly tool to create a blockchain. Starport's beautiful, like it really is. Uh, and Starport is like from Cosmos. It basically you go into your command line, and like you use a few commands, and you got a blockchain. Like it's beautiful. But like if they could then use something like that, but with Avalanche consensus in that blockchain, that would be an, an amazing piece of kit, right? Because I, again, I don't know enough about Tendermint to have a deep, qualified opinion. Um, but my gut tells me Avalanche is better. Uh, again, I haven't done enough. So I, I know Avalanche consensus, but I don't know Tendermint consensus enough to really have an educated uh, critique, if I can put it that way. Um, I know more about Polkadot. They do, this isn't actually a hybrid consensus. What they do is Babe is their uh, consensus engine. Grandpa is their finality. So let's look at how like blocks are produced, right? So let's look at Ethereum. Um, so a block is produced, um, and then everyone like can't like a subset of validators agree, but it's not final because it actually has to go through multiple blocks before they finalize it. So your transactions per second is different to when it's final. So let's say, for example, I submit a transaction, it gets accepted, okay, and then like three blocks later or four blocks later, actually there's a dispute, then it won't be final. They'll revert it or whatever they do, right? So finality is important, um, and I don't see much, I mean, I think Avalanche has the best finality, um, but I don't see this mentioned yet. So TPS is also, it's a broad topic. You've got to, you've got to take finality into account. 
this is the thing. So this is why I was thinking that if if there was some way you could have, because the the way that I was thinking of this and the finality was one of the biggest things that SEQ sold me on in the beginning. And then when you're the actual user experience of you using Avalanche, when you go into all different chains, like hands down the the best user experience I've I've experienced is on Avalanche C chain currently. Um, even I've done some polka dot um, polka dot. Um, what are they called? You know the where the the loans, auctions. the oh, crowd loan auctions. Yeah, I've done I've done a couple of those, and and the user experience was just dreadful in my opinion. Like it was just yeah, yeah. slow and buggy and just not enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering, is that the trade off for Gavin's vision for decentralization? Do you ha- is that a necessary trade off? Like, do you lose speed if you want to ensure decentralization? Or is it possible to also get decentralization um, to ensure we have the freedom that, that we, we were mentioning before? That's yeah. I'm wondering. I mean, again, it's transfers, right? So I think the, the standard we should be comparing ourselves to is, is Visa. So Visa mm-hmm. does X amount. So can a chain do beat Visa? I think that that's going to be the first major like okay well blockchain can beat web 2 right or web 3 does beat web 2 it's as soon as it's and i think you know i think all of these maybe not cosmos but polka dot and avalanche will definitely beat visa in terms of how much throughput they can handle and that's the first thing i, mm-hmm. I guess you know <laughs> visa's a global giant right so if you can beat them i think that's good enough for now <laughs> yeah yeah true so I guess you missed your meeting. <laughs> I did. I did indeed. I might jump up and catch the final twenty minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. Cool. Nice so uh, what's 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 up what's up for the future of the DJ or what's what's the plans? What are we gonna go through next week? Sheesh. Open to suggestions. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. There's too many things that could happen in the next six days, seven days to know exactly what we'll be talking about by then. True, yeah. True. All right, guys. Pleasure to, to join you guys this week. Hopefully, uh, I can join you again sometime soon. Um, usually with the band at this time. So, but yeah, it was cool. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for joining. Awesome. Nice fun, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Ciao. Cheers.